Director Becca Cooks. I am on the Upper House team, and it is my joy to host you in this evening's conversation about multi-ethnic identities with author Chandra Crane. Now, I did say the term multi-ethnic identities, which means we will be talking about ethnicity and race, which are sensitive topics sometimes. So you will likely hear something tonight that doesn't feel completely comfortable or you may disagree with, and that's okay. It is fine that we don't agree all the time. But I want to encourage you to keep listening um, for the sake of pursuing understanding, relationship, and growth in this topic as we move forward together. As Chandra writes in her book, our ability to empathize with people is often directly proportional to how we well we understand them. So I am honored to welcome brothers and sisters of every ethnic background, minorities and majority alike. Uh, our hope is that this will primarily be a space to voice the multi-ethnic experience. Uh, you're getting a window into our hearts, which is vulnerable and beautiful and exhausting. And so I would ask that you hold this time as precious, okay? So if anything in the conversation tonight sparks questions, uh, there will actually be a form in the chat where you can submit those questions, and then Chandra and our panelists will answer those questions directly in a forthcoming Upwards podcast. Also in the chat um, is a link and discount code generously provided by InterVarsity Press to purchase Chandra's book, 40% off. Um, so you can follow that link and purchase her book using the code UHouse40. Okay, let's get into this. I would like to introduce Chandra Crane, um, Chandra is the author of Mixed Blessing, Embracing the Fullness of Your Multi-Ethnic Identity, uh, which just came out in December of last year. She is the Multi-Ethnic Initiatives Mixed Ministry Coordinator with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship USA. She has written for Dirt University's In All Things, The Witness, a Black Christian Collective, InterVarsity's The Well, Inheritance Magazine, and the Asian American Christian Collective's Reclaim Magazine. Married to Kenan, the mother of two spunky daughters, and a member of the multi-ethnic Redeemer Church in Jackson, Mississippi, Chandra is passionate about diversity and family, especially with her own experience being raised in a multi-ethnic and multicultural family. So please join me in welcoming Chandra. Hi! It's so good to see you. Um, our audiences have no idea about this, but being uh, that you're living in Mississippi with all of the crazy weather down there, you and your family like lost power indefinitely this morning. And so we didn't even know <laughs> if we were going to get to see you today. So it's really nice that you're here. Yes, it's an answer to prayer and it's, it's great to be here. Wonderful. Well, um, let me just start by asking, why did you write a book about multi-ethnicity? What prompted that whole process to start? Uh, so I guess we're going for the, the medium length answer uh, as opposed to the long medium answer. Length, right, right. If <laughs> yeah. we can go, you know, three to five minutes instead of the hour yes. for the one question. Yeah, right, 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 right. right. <laughs> um, so there was a book that I read um, when I first came on staff at the university there in Madison at our new staff training called Check All That Apply by a biracial black white woman, Sandy Frazier. And it blew me away. It was the first time anyone had said to me, it is good that you are mixed. It would not be better if you had been born multi-ethnic. Um, God had that planned for you. And by the way, Jesus was multi-ethnic. Um, and that was so precious to me. And so I bought every copy of the book I could find. I gave it away to everyone who I knew uh, was multi-ethnic or had a multi-ethnic family and eventually it went out of print. And so I started asking, what can we do to get this back in print? And the answer I got from my friends at University Press was we really need a book for the next generation. And so I kept um, lovingly harassing them. Well, is, is Sunday available? Can we get her to do it? You know, who could it be? And eventually um, another coworker said to me, well, why don't you write it? Which was terrifying and exciting and precious and life-changing and so i wrote this book um but i wrote it with a lot of different stories which sunday did as well and i think that was my greatest joy in writing it was hearing other people's stories and weaving them together and and seeing again what god has been doing in planning our lives and making us in his image um and that's been so precious to have people 
email me and relate to me that I felt seen and I'm so glad to hear these stories and thank you for creating this community so it has been worth the sleepless nights and the time away from my family and just the general angst of writing it's been wonderful and really worth it yeah and it was a fast turnaround for you right like the book was written in a year or something yeah I mean from start to finish it was a year and a half um between a year and a half and two years um but when I actually wrote the the draft of the introduction at yay collectivo on the square um when I was up there for a writing workshop I um that was several years ago and so it was a long time coming in trying to find the right time for my family the right timing with my job um So it has been both a whirlwind process and also a six, seven year process. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, I love the reference to the book that inspired you, Check All That Apply, because it feels like one of the quintessential experiences of uh, mixed ethnicity people um, a while, well, not that long ago, just a couple years ago, really, where on standardized testing or the census, Mm -hmm. when you had to identify yourself, you could only choose one. And uh, so you were really torn between oh, okay, which of my very equal (laughs) identities do you want me to choose? Um, And I know with my family, we even had to ask, so if we choose one or the other, will that benefit um, our daughter more going forward? Mm -hmm. Um, So it was rather revolutionary when we could suddenly check all that apply or or an option that says multi-ethnic. So that's, yeah, that's a great title to start that conversation. So um, would you answer maybe just this foundational question uh, to start the conversation? Uh, What do we mean by saying mixed or saying Mm multi-ethnic? Because I think it's a a legitimate question that people ask when they're saying, okay, technically aren't most people multi-ethnic? It's like if you have two, um, if you have two European ethnicities, isn't that multi-ethnic? So what makes what we are talking about different or unique? Yeah, so on the one hand, um, I think it's valuable to push back against monoethnic normativity that assumes that everybody can check one, right? And to say, no, there's an experience of life where you you need to be able to check all that apply. But I think there's also uh, a tension there in for those who are multi-ethnic in their far distant ancestry is really a footnote to being white. Um, It's not something that necessarily affects them either in their home or in the broader society on a regular basis. So I think holding those two in tension and saying on the one hand, we should be encouraging folks in their multiple ethnicities and their ancestry and their heritage is so important because I think that starts to shake up all of our thinking about how we can put people in a box and how there are easy answers and how we can know what we need to know about one person and snap our fingers and we're good, right? Instead, digging into the hard work and the joyful work and the complicated work of figuring out how our ethnicities come about and what our ancestry is. But again, you and I as multi-ethnic folks with different parentage we experience the world in a very different way because of that assumption. Mm -hmm. Um, And we feel that tension within our family and that joy, and we feel that tension within society um, and hopefully joy when people start doing the hard work. So I thoroughly encourage and love to hear about white folks doing the the work to research their ancestry and to figure out what it means to be Italian and German and Irish and Russian. Um, But I think the difference is how it affects us today is very different than a hundred years ago and how it would have affected great, great, great grandparents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That totally makes sense. Thank you. Um, So then uh, about the word multi-ethnic, we're using that Mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, in your book, you use it in contrast to the term mono-ethnic. Could you Mm -hmm. uh, describe for us or define for us how you're using both of those terms? Yeah, so mono-ethnic, as I define it in the book, has both a majority culture and minority culture aspect as well. So multi-ethnic people are people of color, even those of us who are pale people of color. Um, And so again, we experience the world in a certain way, the world sees us in a certain way, Um, there are stereotypes and injustices, um, and also there's strength and there's solidarity that are unique to the experience of people 
who are not white, who have not been able to assimilate into whiteness in the United States, especially. Um, but within the category of minority culture or um, people of color, there's this, there are many other marginalized or overlooked communities. So even when you think about within the African diaspora, um, there's a question of, well, what does it mean to be Haitian American? Or what does it mean to um, have ancestors that um, are part of, part of a, an African community that is primarily Francophones, French speakers? Mm -hmm. um, within the Asian community, there are those with the Southeast Asian background or the Hmong people um, or the Karan people, excuse me, the Karen people, I'm trying to make sure I pronounce it correctly, who are refugees and immigrants as well. Their story is very different than those initial waves of um, East Asian immigrants in the 50s and 60s and, and even before then. So part of that uniqueness is that monoethnic folks, whether they are majority culture or minority culture, have a safe space. Um, I'm going to use the word safe carefully, right? Because um, especially for people of African descent, it feels like there are no safe spaces, but within the context of family and a place to feel like they belong and a place to feel like they don't have to choose between their family um, on one side and their family on another or who they are in one part of their body and who they are in another. Mono-ethnic minorities um, often forget what it's like for those of us who are multi-ethnic minorities. And so I think that's an important distinction. And you also mentioned mixed. Um, mixed for me has been a word that I've been able to reclaim in the same way that Brian Bantam wrote a book called, a really beautiful book, a uh, really thick book called um, Redeeming Mulatto. Mm -hmm. And it's the sense that we get to identify as we feel the Lord has given us and that we get to reclaim words that were used for ugly purposes mm -hmm. um, to describe ourselves. And so some folks still prefer um, biracial. So I, I know some of our panelists use the phrase biracial. Um, Sunday considers herself biracial. Um, some people use multi-ethnic, some people use multiracial. Um, mixed for me became this journey that while I was writing the book and trying to figure out a title and praying and asking God for a title, I love a good pun. <laughs> and so I love to check all that apply. And I also love how mixed blessing for me in this season really encompasses that uh, fluidity and that sense of being many different things and that sense of the joy and the pain. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I love that. And I think this is a powerful lesson we have to teach the church. We who are mixed or multi-ethnic or biracial or however we want to be identified that's a valuable thing actually to push back on those norms again and to say this story is more complicated than you think and we do Jesus a disservice when we make assumptions and try and reduce everything down to one thing. Mm -hmm. Which can be a challenge for biracial mixed multi-ethnic people to sure. uh, take yeah. the time to explain that um, and not that we don't want to sometimes we don't even know how um, but there's often a question of like do you have the time or the interest to hear just the complexity of what makes me, me. Um, and so at times, I think we can be tempted to distill down what we are just for ease of conversation or ease of listening. Um, so that's, that's an interesting point. Okay, but thank you. So a difference between multi-ethnic and mono-ethnic, I've got one more definition question for you so that we can just have like a ground, a good foundation of uh, words that we're using. Both of those terms include the word ethnic or ethnicity, which we're all like vaguely aware that it's somehow different than the term race. Not always sure the difference. Could you give us a, a definition that differentiates how you're using those terms and how we'll mostly focus on ethnicity? Yeah, so you saved the easy one for last. Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> um, so one of the articles I quote in the book is an article by ta Coates, who lays out very carefully, uh, and I also quote Jamar Tisby in his work, Color of Compromise, there really isn't a definition of race because again, race is a societal construct. As far as DNA and genetics, there's no difference between um, people from uh, Afri of African descent, people from Asian descent, um, first people of the land, uh, 
genetically, we're all the same. But the idea of race was constructed to enslave and to um, prop up those who were in power already, those who um, have lighter skin, which in some ways comes from the sense that if you had to work in the sun, your skin was going to darken. And if you got okay. to sit under an umbrella, your skin was going to remain lighter. Um, but also just kind of the inherent colorism and brokenness in us. So race is a tricky term. I think, again, with that careful, nuanced work of saying, yes, we are all one race. So it is important to remember that we can't all we can't just say, oh, we're the human race, as though that erases hundreds of years of abuse, especially here in the United States and colorism uh, worldwide and the brutal things that have been done to people of color, especially black and brown siblings. So when we think about race and ethnicity, there's also this issue of culture, right? It's tied up within how people see us. Mm -hmm. I think where using terms like race and ethnicity are helpful is in acknowledging the, the caste system of our country, um, acknowledging the way in which race has been constructed to keep some people below and to, to elevate others. Mm -hmm. And then I think once we have that conversation, race especially becomes a little bit of a footnote because the bible talks about ethnicity as a good thing as a beautiful thing of those tribes and nations and tongues uh and in that sense different skin tones and different cultures that is not a curse that is not um something that is uh negative it's supposed to be a good thing and so i think once we can get past the idea that race should be what it is and talk about ethnicity is what it is and it's a good thing, then I think we can have really solid biblical conversations about how to dismantle issues of race and then also how to uplift um, the goodness of ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting point in your book how once you start focusing the conversation on ethnicity, you realize that people will define ethnicity even by different standards. So mm -hmm. if someone is talking about their own ethnicity, they might be referring to um, their heart language, they might be referring to their ancestry, to their um, past geographical location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that redundant? Past? No, it wasn't. Their past geographical No, because I think there's a specific oh. specificity, uh, especially for like those who are indigenous or right. um, native folks in Hawaii that is rooted in the land. So yeah, I right. think it's absolutely another category. Right, exactly. So given that that's true, I think that adds complexity um, to the topic that can make it confusing or um, intimidating to engage with. So like, how, mm -hmm. how do you step forward to engage someone's ethnicity or ask about someone's ethnicity or just learn more when it feels like it's a moving target? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's such a reasonable question. And the aggravating answer is um, you pray <laughs> and you accept that it's a moving target, which feels very unsettling uh, to us. I think especially, you know, for doing the whole Myers-Briggs things, I am a J on the Myers-Briggs. I like tidy, neat categories, actually. Um, I just like you. multiple categories. Yeah, I just, I like acknowledging that there's more than one category or more than two categories, which is often the discussion in the United States, there's white and then there's black or there's white and then there's people of color. But, you know, I, I hadn't thought about this recently until you phrased your question the way you did, Becca. So I love that you asked it that way. I think even I need to be challenged and am challenged by the Bible to get rid of strict categories and to be comfortable with things that are nebulous and be comfortable with things that are awkward. So when it comes to engaging people in their ethnicity, one of the things that I loved was one of the women that I surveyed for the book and had a really great conversation with um, said she likes to ask people, tell me about your family. Because I think that encompasses so much of ethnicity. It's your family of origin. It's the neighborhood you grew up in. It's the people that you have gathered around you, it's your church family, it's your school. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we can engage people there, then the important parts of ethnicity come out mm -hmm. in that conversation without it having to be, of course, the wildly aggravating and hurtful and frustrating question that unfortunately a lot of multi-ethnic people get asked, which is what are you, right? And to avoid that question entirely, 
to invite someone to share as they feel strong enough, as they feel able in some sort of healthy um, conversation and relationship, mm-hmm. you know, would, would you tell me? I'd love to hear more about your family. That is the opposite of interrogating someone, right? That's imitational. It's uh, building relationship. It's starting the conversation instead of ending it. Mm-hmm. So I, I've been really blessed by asking that question and asking myself that question. What, what do I want to share about my family? What can I learn about my family? Mm-hmm. What parts of my family can I share with my kids and with my husband and with my community um, and different parts of my family? Yeah, yeah. And the uh, often tiring but true component of that uh, is that you're then required to ask that of every person since it is a moving target. Once you ask that of someone and do the work to find that out about someone, that still does not make it true then for another person, even of the same mm. ethnic background. And so you have to keep asking that question with each new person. Um, and that's just, that's hard work sometimes, but it's, it's the meaningful work. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay, well, I would like to dive into your story a little bit more, because um, I think that gives way to some deeper concepts within the multi-ethnic experience, um, things like appreciation versus appropriation and mm-hmm. our like universal desire to learn more about ourselves and all that good stuff. Um, so could you tell us about your cultural and ethnic makeup? So, um, yeah, I define myself as multi-ethnic, Thai, and white American. So my birth father was a Thai national, but I actually never got to marry him. He and my mom split up before I was born. And so um, shout out to single parents. It was just the two of us for the first five years of my life. Um it's funny when you get older, you know, and you realize some things that are a unique part of your culture and your ethnicity that just you assume every family did. So um, I think I've mentioned before in our conversations, my mom, who is white American, because of her time in Thailand, she puts fish sauce, nam pla, in everything, spaghetti sauce and sausage dishes. That's what we used instead of salt. Yeah. Um, and so I grew up with that. I didn't grow up, sadly, speaking the language, but I grew up with some of the cultural mm-hmm. artifacts, some of the cultural aspects of it. And so um, when she remarried when I was five, um, I looked much more phenotypically Asian when I was younger. So I didn't have freckles yet. My hair wasn't curly. Um, I, my eyes hadn't widened at all. And so when she remarried, she remarried the cultural part of my story, which is my black stepdad who adopted me. And so, um, and was, you know, is my dad and was around until he passed away um, within the last 10 years. So I was raised also with a lot of um, prototypical, which I like to say instead of stereotypical, right? Because a stereotype is usually a negative thing It's usually rooted in a harsh judgment against another person. And it usually ends the conversation instead of starting it. So, okay, here's a stereotype of uh, a black family. Good, I'm done. I can check that box. I can put them in that box, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But phenotyp or um, prototypically, um, you know, there there are some parts of black culture that are generally accepted to be good and an important part of your average black family, your average black community. So I was raised with a lot of those. My dad raised me on Motown. Um, so that's what I was, I mean, in addition, you know, I mean, I was raised in, in the 90s as well. So I, you know, was doing the whole grunge thing, but I was raised on Motown. Um, I was also raised on Beethoven because he had a lot of uh, multicultural aspect to him as well. He liked classical music. So you never knew what you would find uh, out in his workshop. You never knew what he would be playing, but I was raised with a love for uh, some Southern foods. And so we had potted chicken, which is just like so tender. And of course we would put fish sauce in it. (laughs) So it's that umami, you know, you gotta do it. Right. There was, yes, umami. So there was a lot of fusion going on in my house. Um, And what was interesting is, and now that I think about it, watching my mom interact with me as uh, this little Asian kid and her black husband, I think it's been interesting to see her do a little bit of work maybe in like, oh, what does it mean that I'm Irish um, and Scottish in my heritage and in my background? And I think that in some ways gave her a sympathy for um, knowing what her ancestors went through that doesn't really affect her today. She's, she's white, she has all those privileges, 
but maybe having a glimpse into what it's like um, gave her the ability to actually appreciate what people of color go through today. And uh, I think that's, yeah, an important part of the conversation because I think, again, when white folks do that work of asking themselves, what does it mean to be multi-ethnic? Um, you know, or what does it mean that I have multiple ethnicities in my ancestry and my heritage? Then they can actually learn how to highlight the marginalized of today. Yeah. Um, and so I think that appreciation for the marginalized was very much present in my home. Mm -hmm. And my parents very much raised me to see multiple perspectives, um, to listen, to not make assumptions about people, you know, as best as they could. And so I, I'm glad I had the upbringing. And it definitely was rooted in the fact that we looked different when we went out to eat, right? It's, it's hard to be, as you well know, in a mixed family and not have some awareness of race and ethnicity and differences and comparisons and judgments and all of those things. Right. So that definitely is a huge part of my story growing up. And especially that I didn't look like either of them. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah that was tricky. That was tricky um, just in the ways that I related to them and related to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. When my family would go out to eat, it still sometimes happens, not as much anymore. Um, we, we always get asked, you know, is the check separate? Uh, assuming yes. Um, and so then when the answer was no, it did just stop them uh, for a little uh -huh. bit and not like a what? But just they kind of did a double take and they're like, oh, OK, it's together. Right. Um, so, yeah. Right. Um, I would like to hear more about how you've processed um, your phenotype, how uh, your appearance and how that's changed. But I will um, ask that when we can get Nicole in this conversation, too, because uh, we all talked about our earrings beforehand. So I think that is yes. a great topic that we will come <laughs> yeah. back to. Um, uh, another part of your story. Well, here you actually in your book just give um, hilarious context in my mind to um, the mathematics of ethnicity, where you're like, OK, so I'm half of you and half of you, but I look like three-fourths of you and I act like nine-tenths of you. And then mm -hmm. culturally, do I relate to 100% of you and 100% of you? How can I be 200%? So there's just like all of these, wait, 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 how do I fit where just pure math doesn't actually make sense? Right. Um, and right. I, I loved how you phrased that. Um, so recognizing that there are these different parts of us that don't necessarily fall within the lines of 50-50, how do you choose which parts of your identity to live out and at what times? Because I feel like that could change given the context that you're in as well. Yeah, so some of that is just automatic, right? It's, it's code switching, which I, I think you know, we'll, we'll talk about with the panel. Um, it is the sense that I just naturally shift when I'm around different family members or in different um, situations. So some of it is really intentional. Um, and some of it is, some of it can be awkward. Um, again, I think it's because of expectations placed on us mm -hmm. because when people look at our phenotype, they assume that we should be able or should act in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are times, and, and we've all seen the awkwardness of someone of whatever majority culture who tries to act in a certain way that is not their own and just how that sticks out and it feels awkward and it feels like appropriation and it doesn't feel like appreciation. Um, but for me, I think it's this sense of how can I, when I'm at my best, when I'm focusing on Jesus, when I'm doing the good work of asking questions of my ethnicity, mm -hmm. it is me saying, how can I honor this community that I'm in? Um, because I think, again, one of the unique aspects of the experience of someone who is a minority culture, who is a person of color, is that sense of, do we have a safe space to be ourselves? Do, do we have to code switch to the majority culture? Uh, will we be judged because we speak a certain way or look a certain way or eat a certain food? And that, that's across the spectrum. You know, that's, that's Asian folks, that's Native folks, um, that's Black folks, that's Middle Eastern folks, that's um, Latino folks. And so sometimes it's just nice to be able to honor my black family by code switching into a more relaxed style of speech. Um, I learned quickly when I taught in an all black school, my kids 
it's not that they couldn't understand me. It's just that if I spoke with precision and the Queen's English, it was not helpful to them. It wasn't honoring to them. It didn't help the classroom and my ability to communicate with them. Mm-hmm. And so there's definitely a sense of what is honoring to those in the round. Mm-hmm. But there's also a sense of me realizing that I get to dig into, especially to what it means to be Thai, even though I wasn't raised with much Thai culture, even though I've only been in Thailand once, even though I only speak a sad, sad, small bit of Thai, probably less than your average tourist, honestly. Um, That is a gift given to me within my heritage and I get to explore it. And so if that, that means if I wanna wear my Thai silk skirt, I get to wear it Mm -hmm. even if I present as white. And if I want to dig into different um, cultural aspects of the food or of the the culture and how to show honor in Thai culture, Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to apologize for that, which sometimes I still am, right? Sometimes I'm still apologetic and I feel awkward, but Mm -hmm. in those times when I'm saying, what does God want of me? He wants me to understand that part of myself better so I can give it to him and honor him for it. And so I think code switching can be both um, very intentional and something that we choose to do as as an act of worship. And it can also be automatic and something we just naturally do because we grew up in these many cultures and because we know what it's like to shift from one thing to another. Yeah. So how have you gone about learning the different aspects of your ethnicity, especially parts that uh, you feel that do feel more distant. So if you grew up in African-American culture, um, Thai culture might feel a little more distant um, because I think that's applicable for mixed people. And I think that's also applicable for um, mono-ethnic or majority culture people as well. If Mm -hmm. we all have heritages to explore, how do we start that? Yeah, yeah. So an easy in is food. Um, Food (laughs) speaks to us, right? And and it's, it's such a, point of joy and communication it transcends barriers um it transcends communication styles like indirect to direct um it transcends um cooking styles you know what may be utterly unfamiliar to somebody can still be delicious and so if you go into it with an open heart and open mind um i think it's a really great way to to start to explore i think the power of multi-ethnic folks Um, or or of our stories comes from our hunger to not just stop there. Because I think sometimes, again, that can be the end of the conversation. Um, The the subtitle of the podcast that that I host is At the Multi-Ethnic Table. And so that sense of drawing together and breaking bread together and coming together and relaxing together. Uh, Another podcast that I've had the honor of being on is about the Thai diaspora and it's called More Than a Noodle because so often you meet someone and they say, oh, well, first of all, if they don't say Taiwan, that's exciting. Like, oh, Thailand. Okay, great. You actually know what country I'm talking about. (laughs) Um, But then usually what you hear is, I love Pad Thai. And it's like, that's great. There's other food. And also, can we keep pushing into that, please? If you really love Thailand and you want to learn more about Thai people, um, let's do a little more work to figure it out, to figure out what is respectful in Thai culture and what is disrespectful or um, how love is shown or what are some funny quirks of Thai um, families and and holidays and celebrations. Mm-hmm. And so um, we have uh, loved celebrating the Thai New Year, which is called Songkran, and it's just a water fight. I say just, it is an all out shameless water fight, um, Amazing. which is really fun, right? Because in other areas, um, I do believe in Jesus. And so I can't really be Buddhist. And so going to temples with my family is awkward and hard. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we are, my husband's a great cook. And so I, I think we, we eat really great Thai food, but we only have access to certain ingredients here in the States. Yep. Um, you know, I'm still not great at indirect communication because I was raised in a lot of um, black and white culture, but the Thai love it when you're willing to splash people. And so if you're willing to just get into the, the spirit, the sanuk, the fun spirit of, I will hose you down. And in Thai culture and Buddhist animist culture, you're, you're supposed to be washing away the bad luck. Um, 
but it falls in April right around Easter every year. And I don't think that's a coincidence. And so as we're celebrating the baptism of Jesus, as we're celebrating Jesus, who um, washes our sins away in his blood, as we're celebrating um, how God makes all things new, I get to take a water hose and hose my children down and say, Happy New Year. <laughs> it's for your culture. <laughs> and so much fun. This and they good. love it. <laughs> this is for your own good. Learn, learn about Jesus and learn about your Thai ancestry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think when we do that deeper work and when we embrace aspects of the culture that are fun or are serious or a little bit strange to us even, um, we're doing the work to say all of, all of the people around the world have some aspect of God in their culture mm -hmm. and bear the image of God. Yeah. And so it's fun to find a way to do that. Um, that also, like I said, involves hosing my children down, which <laughs> any parent or auntie or uncle or grandparent or friend or babysitter can tell you, sometimes you just need to hose them down. And like, there's a little bit of a, <laughs> that's what you get Amazing. for pushing your bedtime. You, you said you needed more water at bedtime. Well, here's more water. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. That's great. Um, and I, I like a concept or what, a concept that I was pulling out of what you said is um, starting at a point, um, whatever point seems most accessible to you or easiest to you. So that may be food, that may be a friend who's willing to talk about it, that may be a podcast or a book. And then um, just start with that and don't feel quite so overwhelmed with everything that there is to learn. Because I think that one step will lead you to another step or um, you, it gives you the option to go to another step. Uh, yeah. Not that I'm like super amazing in this category, but I, I had a friend who introduced me to Korean culture and I really liked it. Um, and so then I got a book on, on Korea and traveling there. And then in the book, it's like, well, if you're ever going to go, you should just learn the alphabet. It's like 26 characters. It's not a tonal language. You can do it. And I was like, oh, OK. So I started doing that. And so it's just kind of like step by step. We'll see where it goes. And I think learning about any culture, whether it's others or your own, can just be that kind of a process. Um, might feel a little less overwhelming yeah well and it's it's the work that white folks can do as well right oh absolutely yeah. to, to look into your own um distant heritage and say mm. oh well what what food do i already know about what food can i learn more about what's my great 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 grandmother's story yeah 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 oh great okay well in like five-ish minutes, which is what we have before we transition to our panel, um, I do want to turn our conversation a little bit towards um, our identity in Christ. Um, and I think that was a beautiful segue that you gave where you're dousing your kids and you're like, this is for your heritage and to know Jesus. Great. I love that. Should we all have that in life? Um, let's see. I have so many questions I could ask you. Let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boil it down to three. Um, First of all, you say in your book that Jesus is multi-ethnic. And so we can not only um, identify with him because we are Christians, but for us multi-ethnic people, we can resonate with that part of him. Um, and you don't hear people frequently describe mm -hmm. Jesus as multi-ethnic. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so Jesus has uh, a very Jewish lineage, but within that lineage is the very intentional inclusion of uh, Canaanite uh, woman, a Moabite woman, um, Hittite woman, which I love that it's all women too. I think that hey. that speaks a word. Hey. That's 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 right. That's right. It's for another panel. We'll we'll go there another time. Okay. Um, <laughs> but those were included very specifically. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus himself ordained before time uh, that he would come someday in the body of a man who had this heritage. And so it's not just a random thing. It's not just like, a, oh, well, that's, that's cool, but it's not a majorly important part of Jesus. Uh, it's actually a hugely important part of Jesus, of Jesus and who he was and who he is still, because that was the plan all along, was for the Jewish race to be pure and holy in the Lord, mm -hmm. but not genetically, mm -hmm. but in terms of following Yahweh and Yahweh only. And so God always planned to include the nations. He always planned to he always planned to have a multi ethnic body of of believers. And it's funny because I was thinking earlier about okay, so we define being multi ethnic or mixed in this moment as not in your distant ancestry, right? As not um, 
something that's a footnote to your life, but for those of us who are mixed, it's a very present, real part of our life. And so that kind of gave me pause, like, oh, wait a minute. Well, but I feel like that's different with Jesus. Why is it? And I think it's because of the multi-ethnic story of the church, because Jesus came very specifically to call people to um, reach out to people who were not seen as part of Israel. When when that was what he was doing all along, right? That's what he was doing in Old Testament days when he was calling foreigners and providing for them and telling his people Israel, if anyone comes, they are part of the family and you should treat them that way. And by the way, you should not pick your vineyards clean because you need to leave food for those who are hungry, um, which again is another conversation time. How much time do we have? We have like a minute left. Um, I also think it's important and significant because it tells us something about um, what parts of culture and ethnicity are valuable. So when Rahab turned away from the Canaanite gods and honored the Lord by protecting the spies and then was spared when Jericho's walls fell down, she didn't mysteriously suddenly just become Jewish uh, ethnically, right? And she didn't even leave behind all of her Canaanite heritage. Um, which I may be making, mixing up my countries now, which that's embarrassing, but um, no, Ruth was a Moabitess, yes. yes. So Rahab, she stayed Canaanite. There were certain Canaanite customs that were not the worship of false gods that she would have kept and would have been passed down in her lineage. Mm-hmm. And it's the same for Ruth, the Moabitess, and it's the same for um, the wife of, of Uriah the Hittite, of Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the mother of David. She passed on parts of her culture that were valuable and holy to the Lord that wouldn't have been there if not for her and her culture and her heritage. So I think it's just such a powerful part of when we feel mixed up, when we feel confused, when we feel disjointed, we can look at Jesus who had a very diverse lineage and say, okay, but he can hold it all together. So he can hold me together. Um, And I think that's been what's the most encouraging thing to me in thinking about Jesus as a mixed Middle Eastern brown person um, is the ways in which he proves that we don't have to all be one thing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we aren't all one thing and he isn't freaked out by that. That's actually his plan and it's beautiful and it's doable uh, with, with his love and with the Holy Spirit's work and as part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, There are, attributes of Jesus that um, demonstrate how he's holding things together. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. things like his uh, humanity and his deity, um, or right. being both priest and sacrifice, um, where there yes. are just these very disparate things that he is very clearly holding together. And yes, he's God, mm-hmm. we are not. But if God can handle that within himself, then surely God can handle the uh, disparate or seemingly disparate cultures and ethnicities that he's put in us. I mean, I really resonate right. with that. Yeah, and we were made in the image of God and we're being made into the image of Christ. So as we accept our identity in Christ more and more, as we grow into our identity in Christ, look at me wrap it back around. I was like, I know there was something I was answering. <laughs> <laughs> the identity in Christ. You're getting there. Um, not as an excuse for whiteness, right? Not as an excuse to be same. But as we're rooting our identity in Christ, we actually can look at our diversity and rejoice in it because he rejoiced in his diversity enough mm-hmm. to to inspire Matthew in the form of the Holy Spirit to write it down uh, as the first part of Jesus' story. Boom, here's his lineage. And we are being made into that identity in Christ. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, um, I want us to dig into the identity of Christ more when we get into the podcast. Um, there are uh, really great ways that are it's it's used um, and like the true ways that it is used, how we are all brought into the body of Christ and we all have can find our identity in him. And then that can also be used in some challenging ways, um, specifically when people ask like, okay, well, why are we making this about race? Like we're all children of God, so shouldn't we be focusing on the gospel? I think that's a longer conversation than what we have time for right now. So we will come to that on the podcast and circle back around. So stay tuned. Um, So you write in your book that the heart of our mixed story is that no one person can embody multi-ethnicity in its entirety. We need each other so we can place ourselves in God's larger narrative. 
So to live out that quote, I would like to introduce our panelists who are going to join this conversation. I'm very excited. Um, so our first panelist is Aiden Deteen. He's a sophomore at UW-Madison. He is our event intern at Upper House. Um, he's a total bibliophile and a self-proclaimed coffee snob. I'm not putting that label on you, but you said that. Um, our next uh, panelist is Nicole Kyle. She is the Director of Worship Arts and Leads Communication and Women's Ministry at High Point Church. Uh, additionally, she is just the general fun bringer to literally any scenario. So welcome, Nicole. And then last but definitely not least is Peter Shackelford, the Executive Assistant of Haunty Enterprises. He's a U.S. Navy veteran and a grill master. So these are all dear friends, and I am so excited to see you all. Thanks for being here. Uh, by way of introduction, would you please uh, tell us what your mixed heritage is? And then since food is such an easy way to enter into a culture, tell us what food from your culture you think is just gold. So let's start with Aiden, and then we can go to Nicole, Peter, and then Chandra. You can absolutely tell us what meal you're feeling for your culture. So Aiden, go ahead. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I am bringing in half Filipino and half Caucasian background. My mom, her parents are from the Philippines, and so she's full-blown Filipina, and I uh, uh, just take half of that. And so the food that I always grew up uh, eating was uh, chicken adobo. Uh, it's the way I describe it to people that have never heard of it is like teriyaki chicken, but you add like more soy sauce, more garlic powder, and a bunch of bay leaves. And it's just, it's fantastic. It's just extremely tangy. And uh, I can only, you can only have so much of it because there's a lot of salt in it, but it's, it's amazing. amazing. So. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. yeah. Hey everyone. I'm Nicole. Um, I am half Mexican, half white. My dad came to the U.S. from Mexico and um, my mom, her mother also was an immigrant um, from England. Um, and so she and I both share some of that culturally. Um, and then food, it's hard. It's a difficult one because I think there are so many great Mexican food options. Um, tonight we had steak tacos and I do think that there is something so delicious about simple grilled steak tacos with just a little bit of cilantro and some lime on it, which is great. Um, but tres leches is like out of this world dessert. Mm. Love it so much. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Peter, you are up, sir. My name is Peter Shackleford. Um, I'm Panamanian American. For those who aren't familiar with Panama, think Panama Canal. It's a small little country at the bottom of Central America. Um, also identify as Latino, biracial, uh, whatever. I'm pretty, pretty flexible. I feel like okay. I have my finger in all of those pies. So um, let's see. Food that is gold. Just pretty much everything because my country is that awesome. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he repping. Uh, oh my goodness. It's a dish. It's a, it's a kind of a, kind of a dish they, that we don't eat very often. It's like kind of like one of those like special occasion dishes. It's like, uh, it's called Ropa Vieja. And uh, it, it literally translates into old clothes. And so uh, be because uh, it, it kind of resembles old clothes, it's, it's, a, it's a shredded uh, flank steak uh, in a tomato-based sauce served over uh, rice and uh, some form of plantains. It's really, really, really good taste, taste, so much more better than it it sounds. Doesn't taste like <laughs> old clothes. No, not at all. <laughs> wow, I would eat it. That sounds great. Chandra, what what food just gets you? Well, so you said food uh, when we were chatting beforehand, but then you said meal. So I'm just going to throw in a little drink as well. So so Thai iced tea uh, is literally gold, right? It's that distinctive orange color, um, and it's so sweet and so good. And then la is a salad, um, which is basically meat. And so I love that Thai culture has a salad that's meat. They have several salads that are meat. And so 
um, lab has a little bit, it reminds me a little bit as Aiden was talking about um, chicken adobo. It has some of that same tanginess and umami that we talked about earlier. Um, yeah. Um, mm, I wish we could all, all go out to eat after this. Because <laughs> this is making me hungry. Mixed Let's have a big reunion. potluck. Next year, yeah. after COVID. Yes, potluck. A little yes. more off. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I'll just jump in because I realized I didn't say anything about my ethnicity. LOL. Um, but I'm half white, half black. And uh, if I could choose a food, man, soul food just seems to really represent that beautiful mix. So give me some fried chicken, give me some cornbread. And I had to start going gluten-free, y'all. And so I made gluten-free fried chicken and it actually worked. I was shocked, but that's, mm. that's another fun fact. So cool. <laughs> I know, right? I was impressed. Anyway, um, let me ask you all, uh, how do you respond to the question, so what are you? What goes through your mind and what do you find yourself saying to people? Um, and I'd like to hear from all of you. So uh, let's start with Peter and then uh, we'll go to Nicole, Aiden, Chandra. Uh, let's see. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of been an evolution, uh, of, of answers. Um, but, uh, Panama being, uh, a, a small, a small country in comparison to the rest of the world, uh, it's like barely a million people, probably a million other citizens abroad in, uh, living internationally in other countries. Um, more or less, sorry if my numbers are a little off <laughs> for the fact checkers out there. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, so it, like, I, like if I say Panamanian uh, American, you know, half, half, half Caucasian, half, half Panamanian, I have to explain the, the Panamanian part um, in, you know, uh, in great length. And most of the time it, it still results in, 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 in an expression of like, uh, I still don't know where that country is, but okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which, which, you know, it's, it's, it's no fault of, it's nobody's fault that, that people don't know. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of places on our planet. So, um, mm -hmm. but that, that's kind of where I'm at, you know, it's a, it's a place of, uh, patience and, and grace, you know, that, Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of, kind of humbling too that that uh, that not very many people uh, are familiar with uh, with uh, Panama. So, mm -hmm. did it take you a while to get to that place of um, you could be patient with the question? Uh, yeah. Um, I just turned. Uh, 40 years old this this the this past year in 2020, uh, and I didn't really have any awareness of of that until I was an adult and and off of my own, uh, especially uh, as a young 20 something in the in the Navy, uh, experiencing all these new areas of the United States and its people, and. Uh, and yeah, getting asked every day by somebody new, what what are you? What are you? You know. Um, so yeah, it definitely it, it's definitely been an, an evolution of 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 answering on my part um, because the like you start off like well I'm Panamanian, duh. Like how how do you not know that? You know, <laughs> like uh, like like it like it's as well known as like a country like Mexico or. Or, or Puerto Rico or, or something like that, mm -hmm. where uh, the, the populations in, in the United States are, are, are a lot more. <laughs> um, so uh, coming, coming to, the, to that realization that, that, it, that it isn't, that there aren't that many uh, people living abroad mm -hmm. um, and that it is a very small, small country. Um, yeah, it took took a little while to 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 wrap my head around. So, mm -hmm. yeah, great. And Nicole, it looked like you were going to jump in, but I'll just let you go for it. Yeah, I I don't respond to this question because nobody asks me this question. Hey, that's <laughs> because okay. Because I just 
I, well, because I look the way that I do, I present fully white. And so I, um, I have three siblings who all have very dark hair and dark eyes and I have, you know, blonde hair and green eyes. So nobody asks me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So then just on that topic for a second, I said, we'd come back to this, um, Nicole, Chandra and I, we were all talking about things that we do that will help us draw a little bit more from our um, ethnic side, just to make us feel a little bit more like the ethnicity that we are. Um, And so one of the main things is our earrings. Um, So as soon as you got on the call, you're like, Becca, where are your earrings from? That those look great. And I was like, I see your hoops. Um, And so maybe, Nicole, could you just give a a couple sentences on how you've processed your phenotype? Yeah, I mean, it's been... A process for sure. Um, mm-hmm. There, I think the more that I, um, I mean, I always identified very easily and very strongly as Mexican American, and I was have always been very proud of that. I have loved that part of who I am. Um, and so, as I got older, and especially as I started to think about how this intersected with my faith. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really uh, sad that I looked the way that I did. Um, And even especially when I got married, because before I was married, my last name gave it away a lot. And so people would Mm -hmm. ask me like, oh, your last name. That's when people would say, what kind of a last name is that? That's the question I would get. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I got married and I lost that. And so I felt pretty emotional about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I have... um, Chandra, one of the things that you were talking about was how like there's not a mistake in being made mixed. And I think for me, what I had to come to is there's not a mistake in the fact that I look the way I do, that I I am mixed. And also I look like this because I think that's really what was hard for me. I felt like, oh, this is a mistake. I'm supposed to look more Mexican than I do. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, there are for sure ways that I have tried to embrace still feeling like I, I, finding a way to express physically how I feel internally. And so sometimes that's wearing hoops. Sometimes that's wearing um, like these, these peasant shirts that I have. I mean, mean, it's it's a variety of things, but um, finding a way to express that Mm -hmm. in a physical way, given the fact that my hair is, you know, blonde and that my eyes are green. (laughs) So it's, it's a, it's been a process, but it's something that I think I resonated with something else you said, Chandra too, that I, I've sometimes felt like, do I even have the right to do this? And I had to get to this point, like, yeah, no, I do. I do have the right to do this. This is part of my culture. And I, I so internally resonate and feel this part of my culture. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just finding a way to express that physically Mm -hmm. that matches what it is that I really do feel internally. Thank you. That touches on some great topics. Um, The imposter feeling that we can have, (laughs) like, uh, I'm not fully that. Can I embrace, can I embrace it if I'm not fully that? And am I, um, am I wrong in doing so in some way? And that is definitely a step forward when we can come to the fact of saying, no, 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 I, this is part of me and that's, Mm -hmm. that's great. So let's, let's learn about it and let's live it out. That's huge. Uh, Aiden, I want to hop over to you as to how you respond when people ask, what are you? Yeah, I, I definitely have gotten this a lot. And I think with me, there was just when people would ask that to me, there was just you could just see the genuine confusion on their face because mm-hmm. my phenotype just kind of comes off as like he's like white, but he's got darker skin and darker hair. He doesn't look overly like Asian, like most people are like, what truly are you? You know, I got a lot of, are you Hawaiian? Are you Native American? Are you like a mixture of Asian or just a, I've I've gotten really a lot of, you know, guesses from people that are very different than Filipino. And so like, it's, it's truly astonishing to see people's reaction when they're finally like, oh, you're Filipino. See, that makes sense now. Um, And so like for me to ask, to answer that, it's, it's always enjoyable. Um, But there is always like, a part of me that always wants to just explain more and more. So when people ask that, I'm like, well, since you asked the question, I'm going to pretty much just tell you the history of my family coming to uh, the U S and so I would explain to them, like <laughs> my grandparents on my mom's side coming to the Philippines and even back before them with like my grandma's father, like uh, serving in world war two and stuff. And um, 
I kind of just t- like would tell them, well, you bought your ticket. You, you might as well just stay for the ride. So uh, I typically take that line? more. Sometimes um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I typically like to tell them longer than they care to hear. Um, so it's, it's always enjoyable. I love, I like, I like telling them the story. So, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, one, one more follow-up question on that. Do you like it when people guess or would you rather that they just ask nicely, what's your ethnicity and not try and guess? What do you feel about it? Yeah, I think that, I don't know. I think where it's, um, where it's kind of like, made me less is or it's kind of made it less fun is when people like assume um i think i think there's a little bit more um i I think there's just a little more innocence to like them being like i had a guess you know like i was wrong and Mm. but i think when people fully assume like oh i'm pretty sure you're asian uh but i'm pretty sure you're like chinese or something i i got a lot of that where people were like oh since he's asian he's probably chinese and that was um that was harder to hear um because i was like well there's so many other countries in asia that uh, have their own unique culture and unique features to them and i feel like it's just you know you're not giving them enough respect that they deserve to um just assume like all these anybody that has asian features probably has a lineage from uh one country and so um yeah that was kind of where it was harder but typically i always like enjoy um talking about myself and my family especially if people ask because i like to assume that they are genuinely interested so yeah yeah Yeah, absolutely so then chandra i i think you resonate with part of what aiden said where if someone can identify you as asian then they're like oh chinese cool uh so how do you respond to what are you yeah i identify so much with everything that that's been said um so sometimes I give a snarky answer, um, you know, like, well, I'm human. <laughs> um, and I like to make people Try say again. it, right? Try again. I like to make people say it like, oh, well, I'm an Enneagram 4, so you know how we are. And like to make them finally say, no, no, I meant what race are you, what ethnicity? Because um, I think it's important that people have to say it mm-hmm. so we can all know what it is they're asking and just kind of be honest about how personal the question that is. Um, I had a grocery store clerk once, like, ask me, and yeah, I usually get the ethnically ambiguous now, um, I present as white a lot, or when I was younger, I looked fully Asian, but he looked at me, and dude said, are you part Thai? And I just about fell out in the middle of Kroger, like, I I was like, how, how, like, it's, you know, it's spooky, right? He's like, oh, well, I see your freckles. And I had a girlfriend, and then he started to get a little creepy, you know. And so oh, that, no. <laughs> that conversation had to be cut. And my husband's st- my husband's <laughs> staying right next to me, you know. And he's like, she was beautiful. And, you know, I just think, and I'm like, okay, just wow. give me my receipt. Thank you. But <laughs> I just so appreciated. Thank you, Nicole, for what's such a good word. Like, I don't think I had done the work, which is why I love hearing people's stories of saying, no, it would not be better if I still presented as mostly Asian like thank you for that because I think again that's pushing back into whiteness of saying no actually this is how God designed me and I don't have to default to how I look um I can still embrace my culture and and my multi-culture too right which I you know I do not have black ancestry in the sense of genetics but you know my grandma and my aunties would would have something to say if they heard me say that I you know am not a part yeah. of that family um, so thank you for speaking that sweet word over me. And, and I'm really going to be pondering that one for a while. Mm. Cause I think that is such a beautiful answer to what are you like? Well, I, I look how I look and that's a good thing. And I am who I am. Mm-hmm. And that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. I would like to, um, ask, gosh, I'm looking at my list of questions. Um, I want to ask how ethnicity was talked about growing up. And um, I think then the question that will follow is, um, given your experience growing up, how do you address ethnicity with your families now? So actually, let me ask, how was ethnicity talked about growing up to 
Peter and Nicole, because I think your answers are a little different. Um, and then Chandra and Aiden, I, I'm going to address the second half of that question to you, because you both have different um, life scenarios for that. So uh, Peter, why don't you go first? Uh, let's see, growing up um, with a Caucasian father and a mother who was 100% Panamanian, um, and I was born in Panama, but moved to Wisconsin when literally months old. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Let's look like the first five or six years of my life. It wasn't an issue. Like I was home with my mom. My mom was a stay at home mom and, and we spoke Spanish all day, every day. Um, but then uh, it was time for me to go to school. And this was before all the uh, bilingual curriculum stuff hit, you know, um, this is, this is back in the, the mid, mid to late eighties. Um, and like I had, I had to learn English. So me and my mom, <laughs> mom stopped talking to me in Spanish <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, all of a sudden my, my Spanish, my Spanish kind of disappeared and my, my English became my, my primary language. Yeah. Um, uh, outside of that though, um, it, it really wasn't uh, a topic of conversation. Not, not because it was like uh, intentionally uh, hidden away or, or denied or anything, but it did just uh, um, our, our life, our life just kind of flowed in a way where um, it, it was never really an issue um, when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know if that was uh, my parents protecting me and my younger sister from that or, or if it just happened that way. But um, yeah, it, it really wasn't ever talked about. Yeah. Okay. And so then, Nicole, do you resonate with that or was your experience different? It was pretty similar. Um, I think, so I have three older siblings. Mm -hmm. um, we had a similar experience where uh, initially my dad would speak exclusively in Spanish. And my, my mom is actually also fluent in Spanish. She met my dad right after she came back from studying abroad in Spain. And so they both speak Spanish, but she would speak English to us. He would speak Spanish. But by the time I was older, that kind of had finished probably for similar reasons to you, Peter. So, um, mm. so, but I think like I, what I resonate with what you said is that it's, we didn't talk a ton about it in our family. Cause it just was mm. like, it, that just was our family. And we would, we wouldn't, you know, a lot of people would like go on family vacations to Washington DC or to like natural or like national parks state but like we would save our money and we would go to mexico and visit our family there like so it just was it just was what it was and like mm -hmm. our, i didn't think about it very much it wasn't actually until we moved to a very small rural town in wisconsin and i went to a high school that was really rural and there was a support group for minority students and that's really where um I, I started talking more about these things and I, and I, my siblings were a part of it too. I think that was the first time where I started understanding like, oh yeah, this, this is kind of different. And I mean, I had glimpses of it in, in other seasons of my life because for a while we lived in Texas and I, I remember the first time I ever realized that I was different was when we were learning about the Alamo and the Texans were being taught as like the, these just incredible heroes. And the Mexicans were being portrayed as the evil enemy. And I just sat there feeling like, ah, this doesn't feel right. Like something feels really off here mm -hmm. because these are both my people. And I, I feel like I, I just remember feeling so torn. And that was mm -hmm. sec second or third grade. Yep. Um, so, so I was aware of it, but mm -hmm. it wasn't until high school where I started talking more about it with peers but again that was more peers than family yeah. um because for family just that's just was there's mm -hmm. who we were we would speak in spanish and in english at home with both my mom and my dad and we just kind of flow back and forth and um between like cultural and like we were listening to 
mariachi music and then also Beethoven. Like similarly, my dad was, and and then the Beatles and then Motown. Like he just had, a, he wanted to listen to all sorts of stuff too. So it, we didn't talk about it. We just kind of experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then following from that, I imagine how you were raised with your ethnicity or how you were raised talking or not talking about your ethnicity kind of informs how you want to impact your own families as uh, you're going forward and they are experiencing their ethnicity. So Aiden, you're going to get married this summer. So I'm curious to hear how you have processed bringing your fiance into your ethnicity. And then after you talk, Chandra, I'd like to hear how you and your husband have approached helping your daughters process their ethnicity. So Aiden, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, like Becca said, I'm, I'm getting married in the summer um, to a wonderful, godly Caucasian woman. Uh, her name is Morgan. She's great. Um, and uh, I think she's actually she maybe tuning in tonight, actually. Um, Hello, but hi, Morgan. <laughs> if she's here, hi. Um, but she, she's just been so curious and so just loving to ask me different questions about um, being raised um, biracially and um, just to spark just wonderful conversation um, together. We've had just so many good conversations. She's been so curious about uh, just my story and my experiences about that. And, um, you know, talking about uh, one day having kids, she is something that she would, you know, be encouraging me to, to, to share with our kids one day to um, share with them about um, my, you know, experiences growing up, my grandparents from the Philippines, but also, you know, bring them to my mother who carries on some of that legacy and a lot of the Filipino cultures as well. And so um, I'm very excited. And I think the biggest thing too, she's really excited about is I think she takes a lot of pride in one day having a quarter Filipino kids. She's told me just that so many times. She's just like, our babies are going to be so cute. They're going to be quarter Filipino <laughs> and they'll be adorable. I'm just like, exactly. They're going to be great. So great. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if they yeah. turn out to just be all white, they'll still be cute. Oh, they'll still be cute regardless. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Huh. Uh, so Chandra, how have you and your husband um, thought about your daughters and their ethnicity and how you want to process that with them? Yeah, so I, I love the perspective from both Aiden and Nicole of not fetishizing mixed kids, um, but not mourning when your mixed kids present as mostly white. That, mm -hmm. that feels like a really tricky, um, but important, valuable middle ground. And one that I think we mixed folks do well in understanding is what does it look like to rejoice over um, our family members, no matter how they present. Um, our daughters have known about fractions from young age. So that again, that, they're quarter time. And so they, they think that's pretty cool. Um, it's been interesting as I've grown, even in my journey in the last 10 years, um, our daughters, our oldest is 11, our youngest is five. And so even in the time since we moved here to, to Mississippi, I feel like I've been able to really have the space to ask, what does it mean to be Thai? How to include little elements of Thai culture, um, and also how to help them, you know, their, their black granddad passed away. Um, he passed away before our youngest was even born. And so what does it look like to include aspects of that culture to be at a church for us to intentionally be at a church with a blackhead pastor um, to identify with and explore Mississippi culture. What's interesting to me is the ways because of their phenotype that they experience it differently. Mm -hmm. So the older is my mini me, you know, it's definitely eerie. Um, and so she has more of that quarter tie mixed look. And so she gets very different interactions from people asking her, what are you? Whereas our younger daughter looks more like her dad. And so she has the ruddy cheeks. You know, he's, he's Caucasian, um, he's white American. She has the ruddy cheeks and her eyes are a little bit with epicanthal folds, but not as much. And um, the 11 year old is fascinated more by the language. So she's very irritated with me that I don't speak it. Um, and the six year old is more fascinated with 
you know, the silks because she wants to dress up and be fancy and then climb up a tree. So that's that's a glimpse into little girls in Mississippi and our little girl. But when we talk with them about it, we've tried to be as natural as possible. So to not make it this exotic, strange thing, but to say, this is a part of your heritage. This is a part of who you are and you can explore it or not. You can ask questions about it or not. You know, here's, here's Graham's story, your, your white grandmother's story. Um, I think that has served us well now that they know they can ask questions, but also they don't have to be forced into it, which is hard because I want them to be excited about it, right? I want them to dig into that culture. I want them to succeed. Like I told them recently, if we, when we finally get to go to Thailand, we were planning on going summer 2020. When we finally get to go to Thailand, I want you and your grandma, your great grandma, to like tease me in Thai together. Like I would love that if you guys spoke Thai well enough, that she could say something silly and you would understand it and you could say something silly back. And my goal in life is, you know, then the next time we visit Thailand to then not let them know how much I know and like zing in there with, I do understand you this time. (laughs) Right, right. But I want them to be able to have that option um, that in some ways I didn't have to explore their culture. And that takes more work and it, and it can be more painful and more difficult, but I appreciate my husband in supporting that endeavor. I appreciate um, the resources that are there on the internet that my mom didn't have when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a conversation that I love having with them and hopefully in a way that's not uh, pushing them or frustrating them or making them rebel against it. So yeah, prayers, you know, (laughs) prayers for that work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So how have you all felt loved in the process of thinking through your multi-ethnicity? And that question is really coming from um, actually a lot of our majority culture audience who submitted questions beforehand. Um, and they, some of them are teachers with classes who are very multi-ethnic. Some of them um, are adopting kids that are different races than they are. And they're like, okay, I want them to feel supported and know their own culture. Um, and I remember one question in particular said, our kids are dating or engaged to people of other ethnicities and we're so excited about it. How can we welcome them in in a way that they feel like loved and um, that it's, it's like an appropriate mm-hmm. fandom, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, so how, how have you mm-hmm. felt loved in this experience? Um, I'm just going to open that up to anyone who wants to talk first. I can um, share at least my first quick thought. Go, girl. <laughs> Um, not making people choose. Mm. Um, I'm getting more emotional faster than I expected, but I, I think that has been a hard thing, especially, um, I think because for, in so many of the conversations I've had with people who are mixed, who are multi-ethnic, we do go through experiences of feeling like we don't belong fully in one place. We don't belong fully in the other. And, um, and yet resonate so deeply with both cultures. Um, and so I think giving space for your multi-ethnic friends or your multi-ethnic sons and daughters-in-law or future multi-ethnic grandchildren to just not have to choose and pick who they are, but to celebrate fully both parts of their culture Mm -hmm. and to see and recognize that both are good. Mm -hmm. Um, Because already I think we put the pressure on ourselves (laughs) to like pick or feel like we should fully 100% be able to um, identify with both cultures. And so I have felt loved, I guess maybe less that I have felt loved. I have felt hurt when I have felt like I've had to choose. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I have felt loved when people want to hear about these other parts of my culture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Girl, you get emotional. That was, that was great. That's a very <laughs> personal topic. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts on that question? Um, I, uh, the, the last two years of my undergrad, I, I transferred to, uh, uh, Edgewood college here in Madison. And uh, I was just uh, being a Navy veteran. I, I was I was like a you know older student, um, 
So uh, I was just like, I set on the goal, just get in, just complete degree requirements uh, and graduate, get out as fast as possible. Um, but there, you know, to, to my like shocking surprise, there was a, a, a very like small but, but vibrant Latino student population. Uh, this is a this is a small liberal arts college of like I don't know five or six thousand students total, like graduate and undergraduate. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I got you know my my curiosity got the got the better of me, and I <laughs> went and <laughs> went and checked it out, and and uh, was 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 met with with nothing but uh, welcome and uh, uh, just just like friendship and and uh um a camaraderie that i never would have found probably anywhere anywhere else mm -hmm. um so um like that was that was so valuable to me because uh um growing up you know my 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 multi-ethnicity was 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 not discussed uh wasn't really discussed much during my five years uh, serving in the Navy, um, coming back for the first few years, uh, reintegrating into civilian life still, you know, still wasn't like, it was, it, would, it just, it just never came up. Um, and so, uh, and so it was, it was like that point where it like, oh, there, there is this like desire that has been dormant to, to rediscover this, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Um, something that I knew once, but had just long forgotten about, and so that that experience and 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 uh, those peers that I met there, um, I will always I will, I'll always treasure that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any last thoughts on that question before I ask our final question? Yeah, I think I think my last thought with that too is just like taking part in mourning with this um, because I think a lot of times when we do talk about our experiences and our story a lot of it does come from a place of brokenness and a place of hurt and mm -hmm. it's often I mean especially when talking about some of the brokenness for my story and even hearing Nicole talk about it too it, it does get emotional it does get hard and so I think mm -hmm. I think taking part in um, celebrating us and loving us by mourning with us and being like, yeah, I, you know, maybe I don't fully understand your experience, but I understand that it's, you've been hurt by people who don't completely understand, but I would do want to care for you in this way and mourning with you and let you know that you are valued and you should, yeah. like, we want to celebrate you and we want to care for you. And, you know, sometimes that's the best way of doing that. So, yeah. Amen. I just think that's beautiful. Aiden, uh, <laughs> the call to lament, which is such a powerful part of the person and people of color experience, right? And mm -hmm. I think when we do that well for anyone else, um, what a glimpse of heaven. So yeah, lament with us, make space for us. I think it's really, really gracious and kind and the least we can all do for each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my last question, because this, uh, book that Chandra wrote is called Mixed Blessing. Um, and just from my experience of getting to talk with you all about uh, parts of your story, uh, overall, we really like being mixed and we think it's a good thing. Um, so could you each just tell me like what you like about being mixed? What is so good about it? Maybe it's uh, music, as I see Peter jiving over there. Um, maybe it's a new perspective that you have on the world. I don't know. What do you like so much about it? Why is it so good? Why don't you tell me that? Um, let's go Aiden, Peter, Nicole, Chandra. Oh, that's so hard. There's so many, there's so many great things about being mixed. Uh, it's, it's hard being thrown under the bus right away. Um, <laughs> I'm throwing you under the bus, man. Okay. It. It's just, it takes me, it's going to take me a bit. Um, I guess the first one that I thought of is like, um, rejoicing in seeing other people that come from a similar background to you. Uh, especially, I think this is partially coming from like Filipino culture. Um, 
there's so much nationalism in the Philippines and like with every country, I would add. But I think they're just, for some reason, growing up, like whenever my mom or I would spot somebody that we found out was like partially Filipino, there would just be a ruckus in the house. We would just be so happy. Like um, in one of the Super Bowl halftime shows, Bruno Mars was playing. and The best one. The best right. halftime and, show. Right. Very, very arguably the best one. And I, I think so too as well. Um, but we looked him up because I was like, he he looks he looks like he could be Filipino. And, and so we looked him up and we we're like, he's half Filipino. And like <laughs> the whole we celebrated, like we didn't care who won at that point. We we're just like, <laughs> Bruno Mars is half Filipino and he's amazing. And and so we like, you know, would spend hours the rest of the night. We were just trying to actually look up other celebrities that you know had filipino background to them and we found a lot you know there's a lot out there and so it was just super cool to to see that and you know i know that there's other people that um you know take and take part in that that pride of um being of having that background as well so yeah i think that that's that's, that's the answer Aiden, that was a great answer for having to go right away. <laughs> Sorry to throw you under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, go for it. Uh, let's see. Um, can you could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I got I got lost with Aiden's. Uh, <laughs> what commentary. do you like? What do you like about being you, Peter? What do you like about being multi-ethnic? Oh man, uh, what do I like about being multi-ethnic? Um, a good question right i feel like this uh this like uh rare i don't know gem or rare piece of art that that people encounter but uh don't really know what to make of and it piques their curiosity because they want to know more mm -hmm. and uh and then in turn challenges me to want to know more about myself uh, and, and where I come from, um, uh, and where my ancestors come from and, and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, but, uh, touching, touching on the celebrity thing, kind of like, kind of like Aiden did, uh, out, out of nowhere, I became a, a New York Yankees fan because, uh, the greatest relief pitcher of all time is Panamanian and his name is Mariano Rivera. What? And, uh, and he just, he just retired like a few years ago, but, uh, but while, while he was over, like, like for his, his, as soon as I found out he was Panamanian, like I was like, okay, all right, let me, let me, let me get that. Let me get that Yankee schedule. Let me, let me, uh, <laughs> when, when are they coming to Milwaukee? Uh, <laughs> That's so good. Um, and then sharing, sharing the food, like, like uh, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of my friends never knew what a plantain was. Um, and what <laughs> a sad life to live! Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can make make them so many different ways, and uh, and like food, food is the, the the greatest gift, like to share in ethnic in ethnicity, as we've as everybody on the panel has touched on already. Um, so like I, I love sharing staples of of, of that the, mm -hmm. the food from from Panama and stuff. So um. awesome, thank you. All right, Nicole and then Chandra, maybe in like a minute each. Okay, <laughs> uh, that's hard for me, but I will try. Minute and a half. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, I think I resonate with the like meeting other people like me. Um, I, like there's something about that. I do also love sharing the food. I'm so thankful for my husband's passion of food <laughs> because that has been a really easy way for him to try and enter into different cultures as well. And so I'm grateful for that. Um, I, I there A few years ago, there was a video, I guess this was like 10 years ago now, but it was a commercial for Univision, which is a um, Spanish television channel that's broadcast in the U.S. and it was um, talking about the duality of a lot of Latinos in the U.S. And, it, mm -hmm. and I remember it saying like, I love tacos and I love hot dogs and I love the World Cup and I love the Super Bowl. 
And I just felt like, oh, yes, that is that is so much of what I love about being mixed is that you get to take from like take beautiful things from multiple cultures. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think the like what all of this for me points to is that I think there is a lot that the church can learn from mixed families about the beauty of what the church is meant to look like and the nature of not choosing to leave, but choosing to engage and come together and say, no, okay, well, like for my husband and me, I mean, we're married, so that's it. And so we don't have an option except for to learn about each other's cultures. And like the same for my parents that like, they just that was it. (laughs) They, they were, our family had to figure it out. And I think Mm. learning how to do that, um, mixed families, biracial and bicultural families have in some ways paved the way for the American church. And there's just a beauty of what God intended for his people to look like in tearing down dividing walls of hostility and allowing from people who were once foreigners to be brought near by the blood of Christ, not just near to God, but near to one another. And I love that being mixed is a, is a, a, like a very literal image of that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a shadow of the greater picture of what is meant for the church. Yes. Mm. We get to be physical embodiments of reconciliation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Chandra, bring us home. Okay. Amen. Um, so one of my taglines is cheerfully defying stereotypes. Mm-hmm. And so I think that really sums up for me what being mixed is about is messing with people's stereotypes mm-hmm. in a very defiant biblical way, yeah. um, but also cheerfully, even in the midst of lament. And so um, I also grew up in New Mexico. And so I think I am able to push back and also appreciate cultures well. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my Spanish is way better than my tie, which is not saying much, but um, so again, that ability, I think we have to explore and engage with other cultures Mm -hmm. um, and to find points of connection Mm -hmm. and to to look and say, here's how my story is unique. Here's how it also overlaps with many other stories. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, amen, Nicole, that that is a word to the church that we need desperately right now. Um, and real quick celebrity, um, because, you know, if, it wouldn't be me if I didn't geek out for a hot second, is Chloe Bennett, who is white and also Chinese and is awesome. And, you know, she was in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and watching kind of her story and her transformation, both as someone who they portrayed specifically on the show as having a white dad and an Asian mom, which is it's opposite in real life. But um And also watching her explore, you know, her superhero abilities, spoiler, but (laughs) she chose the last name Bennett because when she went by Chloe Wong, she was not getting callbacks uh, because people want to cast her, but she picked her dad's first name Bennett to still honor her heritage. Mm. I love that. I love that ability to mess with people and to say, I'm going to push back on this stereotype and this norm, but I'm going to do it in a way that is authentic to me. Um, and I think that's something that we do well as mixed folks. And I'm glad, even though I'm tired sometimes, I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for sharing with us. Um, it has truly been a gift to hear from you. So thank you for engaging. And thank you, everyone, for sticking with us even a couple minutes late. Uh, we are grateful. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions that Uh, came from this conversation, you can submit those questions in a form that is in the chat, um, and we will address those questions in a forthcoming podcast, in the Upwards podcast. So Chandra, Nicole, Aiden, and Peter, and me, we'll all come back to talk about those things. If you would like to hear more uh, multi-ethnic stories, you can actually listen to more on Chandra's podcast called Mixed Blessing, Breaking Bread at the Multi-Ethnic Table. Um, And finally, I would encourage you to purchase Chandra's book. Again, it's called Mixed Blessing, and uh, you can find that at InterVarsity Press. And you can use the code uh, UHouse40, which is specifically for Upper House guests to purchase her book at a discounted rate. So thank you, IVP. Um, Deep gratitude to all of you for being with us, and have a great night.